Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another exciting virtual tour with the Foss Waterway Seaport. And of course, me, your host tonight, Pretty Gritty Tours. I'm happy to be here, and I'm excited because the Seaport gave me a little more latitude tonight to kind of talk about what we're doing and the crux of our program tonight of what we're going to be exploring is, of course, the Contiki Voyage with Thor Heyerdahl. But as you may or may not already know, they just had a phenomenal presentation from someone who was close with the Heyerdahl expedition and did a really good job of like breaking that down. So I'm not really here to just teach you about the Contiki expedition and the life and times of Thor Heyerdahl. Tonight, I would like to celebrate and discuss how do I phrase it? Being incorrect when you are also right. <laughs> and this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. As someone who is an online content creator, someone who works in history and boosterism, there is a, a line where you trod, where when you put something out on the internet, for example, you open it up to critique and people are very swift with the internet at their fingers to point out when you get a day wrong or whatever, you know, but there is, there is something to be said for risk taking and adventure and expeditionary exploration and trying at your very heart to do something right, even when sometimes you're incorrect. And I think that is the essence of the Thor Heyerdahl story. I think it is the essence of what we're doing here with virtual tourism. And I absolutely believe that it is the backbone of the greater Tacoma area. So with bold comments like that under my belt, shall we embark on a journey together, my friends? I think the only answer is yes. So let me catch you up really quick. The Contiki Expedition uh, was a 1947 journey by raft, <laughs> let that sink in for a second, across the Pacific Ocean. So they went from South America to the Polynesian Isles, and it was led by this handsome fellow right here on your left, Norwegian explorer, adventurer, and overall cool dude, Thor Heyerdahl. And the raft was named Contiki which he named after the Inca god Viracocha, uh, for whom Contiki was said to be an old name. So there's some basis for you. But uh, this has gone on to be not just an inspirational Nat Geo story, but also, um, goodness, a 1950s documentary film, a 2012 dramatized film, and all sorts of Academy Award winning things, as well as a book, several lectures, uh, I believe it was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film when it came out in 2012. Like, this was a, a expedition that loomed forefront at a lot of people's minds, and there's so many elements to it, I think, that, that make this a sticky story. But here's the basis. If you learn nothing else, if you tune out right now, awesome. A Norwegian by the name of Thor Heyerdahl built a raft out of balsa wood, and then sailed that sucker from South America to Polynesia across the Pacific Ocean. And for those of you who live here next to the Pacific Ocean, you know that it is the most unforgiving, unyielding, completely just doesn't care about your life whatsoever entity, perhaps on this great spinning sphere we call Earth. 
And if you've ever circumnavigated, sailed, or even just jumped in the icy waters of Puget Sound, you know that building a balsa wood raft and trying to sail it in 1947 across the ocean is as close to brilliance and insanity as one could get at that time, I think. And Heyerdahl's whole expedition was based on this passionate, zealous fire inside his heart that he believed that the people from South America could have reached Polynesia during pre-Columbian times. And so he was just going to prove it, right? This is pure, pure science at its best. He was like, Polynesia, there are people on it. And everyone was like, okay, we can agree with that. And he was like, where did they come from? And everyone's like, nobody really knows, but we have theories. And he's like, well, my belief is they could have very easily come from South America. And they're like, well, yes, possibly, blah, 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 blah. And so he's like, all right, let's just prove that sucker. And so scientific method builds himself a raft from materials and technology that would have been available at the time. And because he's not insane, he stocks it with enough survival equipment and tools that if the experiment goes wrong, they're still in a controlled eh, environment and they set sail. Good for them. <laughs> so the Contiki expedition is mounted in 1947. They get a bunch of support and decide that this is going to be what they're going to do. Now, of course, before you get all up in my comments about this, yes, we know that the scientific evidence today suggests that Heyerdahl was off the base, that based on genetic evidence and looking just at the world as we have it today through archaeological evidence, linguistic, cultural, genetic threads, we have enough of a base now to support a very strong theory that, in fact, people came out of Eastern Asia and then colonized the Polynesian Isles all the way up to Hawaii over a period of time. And here's a nice little outline for you. <clears throat> Number one in red is the prevailing theory today. But of course, um, 2A and 2B, it's worth noting, over here in South America say that, in fact, people could have also left from South America and colonized some isles. And so there's a blend here. But the pervasive theory is, of course, that everybody left from East Asia and went across. But we didn't know that in 1947. And so they got together. This is a picture of the Contiki with the crew on board. And they decided that they were just going to sail this sucker across. And one of the things that I hope you notice right away, for those of you with seafaring experience or who know anything about water whatsoever, this has a very um, low threshold here. You know, this is not a bark with seven feet of freeboard up from the water line. This is a raft, a freaking raft made out of balsa wood that they stitched together with manila rope. And they're just going to sail this thing across. And so this wasn't the only expedition that Heyerdahl did. If you're familiar with his work whatsoever, he did several expeditions and really tried to prove just that um, early navigation was possible, that the people from thousands of years ago had the technology and the intuition and the skills to be significantly more advanced than we gave them credit for in the 1940s. Uh, this is a picture of his other vessel made of papyrus. This was the Tigris. And um, while Thor Heyerdahl is predominantly known as the guy from Contiki sailing across the Pacific Ocean, he also did several Atlantic expeditions. And this is one of the other ones uh, that he did. The I'm trying to think what it is. Ra, Ra 2, and the Tigris all sailed around the Atlantic, proving essentially the same idea, just in different areas, that one could, with ancient technology, sail great distances and really conquer and colonize the globe effectively. And that that could account for the way that people have dispersed themselves across the great globe as we know it. And there's a I hesitate to call it just a shrine, but it's a museum uh, dedicated to the Contiki expedition in Oslo, Norway. Uh, this is the Contiki itself. They took that raft and installed it inside the museum in Oslo and that you can see it. 
And so this is the raft, right, that left Peru in April of 1947. And to make sure that they didn't, like, run into another powered boat or something, right? They towed it about 50 miles out. That's 80 kilometers from my European audience. And the Peruvian Navy gave them a little push start. And then they sailed roughly west, you know, as much as they could, really in the Humboldt current. The, the current did a lot of the heavy lift for them. But they were propelled predominantly by that sail that you see there. And then on July 2nd, they hit their major, major hiccup, which was a rogue wave. And my sailing people out there might know a little bit about this. I don't know if you guys have seen White Squall. Think of it more than just like, oh, a boat wake came up on the shore. Like when the ocean comes to play, it goes hard and it plays for keeps. And so a rogue wave is a very daunting, terrifying, death-inclusive experience. And so uh, this was a big a big deal when their balsa wood raft got hit by it here. Oh, I want to make sure you guys still there. Can you hear me? Hopefully you guys are, are still here. So they, they were sailing across. They get hit by this rogue wave and then manage to, to survive it. But two more waves just keep crashing down on the Contiki. And after three waves, there was this like quiet. And in that moment, I think a couple things solidified for them where they were like, the ocean is here to kill us and doesn't care about us whatsoever. But also, people could have done this. And so they continued on. And their first sight of land was on the atoll of Puka Puka on July 30th, which was the 97th day after their departure. And Heyerdahl assumed, kind of calculated, that it would take about 100 days to reach one of the Polynesian Isles if they set sail from Peru, and they hit it, right? Um, within a three-day margin is pretty, pretty extraordinary. And again, all of this has been, at this point, um, proven to not be the predominant method that the Polynesian Isles were discovered. Uh, this one here is the Hukulea, uh, in the 1970s, 1976, predominantly, a Polynesian navigator uh, came forward with the idea that the Polynesian Isles were settled by navigators, wayfinders, and that you could do it on one of these traditional Polynesian craft, one of these double hold ones. So if you've seen Moana, you get the basis of where we're coming from this here. And so that idea of reading the stars, reading the currents, feeling the temperature, knowing the seabirds and the life around there, and then being able to just by reading those signs, navigate thousands of miles through the empty blue to a destination is exactly what we're talking about. And then back, right? It wasn't a one-way destination. You could arrive somewhere and then come right back, hypothetically. Uh, and so by sailing from Hawaii down to uh, French Polynesia and then back and then doing several other trips, this with the Hokulea really set up the scientific theory today that in fact the Polynesians left East Asia, colonized the Polynesian Isles using their own skill and so on and so forth. And Heyerdahl's theory was much more primitive than this. It was the belief that you know, you could just take the materials at hand, kind of shot in the dark, basically go as the wind went and arrive somewhere. The wayfinder theory is much more advanced and that the people that left, um, for example, from Tahiti to Hawaii, or in this case, from Hawaii to Tahiti, um, that you would do so intentionally. And that's, that's what we're talking about here, right? Is that the theory and the evidence to support it changed over time. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what the scientific theory is supposed to do. You're supposed to be like, oh, I have a theory. And then you test it. And you're like, well, no, it turns out that was wrong. And then you go from there. And so one of the things that um, hits the Heyerdahl expedition these days is that he was wrong. You know, he was wrong about his initial theory that people all left South America and arrived in Polynesia, but he was right in that it could be done. And he was very much right about the spirit of the expedition, that 
to do it, to know, to take that chance is the ultimate, the ultimate goal here. And that's what I'm going for here. And I think so the, the Oslo museum does a good job of representing that. So I got to visit there, good Lord, back in 2018, pre COVID. So it doesn't mean anything anymore. It was like a million years ago. Um, but this is the, the Contiki raft there. And so the main body of this is compo composed of nine balsa tree trunks, uh, approximately 45 feet long and then two feet wide. And they lashed it together with hemp ropes and then put these cross pieces of balsa log on there. <laughs> and Heyerdahl really wanted to make sure that everything was done with local materials and primitive technology to ensure that he proved his theory as effectively as possible, you know, that they weren't cutting any corners on that. Um, pine splashboards clad the bow. Uh, that's that sort of box shape that you would have seen in the previous picture. Let me see if I can bring it back up for you guys here. There it is. Just to prevent, you know, as the name suggests, water from flooding it every single day. Uh, and then all of this was lashed together with more hemp. And then they used um, wedges in between the balsa logs as center boards to keep it on track. And then the main mast itself was made of lengths of mangrove wood, which were then lashed together uh, to create that sort of A-frame that you can see here. And behind the main mast, main mast was their cabin. And this is plated bamboo. And this sucker is only 14 by 8 feet. Uh, again, that's 4.3 meters by 2.4 meters, if I'm not mistaken, for my European audience tuning in. I assume there's like two of you right now. Uh, and then they roofed it with banana leaves. They made a banana leaf thatch for that. And so the mainsail there is one of my favorite parts. That's uh, on a yard of bamboo stems and then lashed together across there. And so all of this together was the raft that they took. Uh, they tested it on a variety of things. They used a bunch of different materials beforehand before they just took that sucker out onto the ocean. But this is how they got across the Pacific, which is absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> I don't know how many of you grew up near a lake or a river. And if you ever like, like I can make a cardboard box float. I don't know if you spoke like that, but I definitely did as a child. And so Early experimentation in seafaring is a dangerous thing. I'm pretty sure I took more than one Rubbermaid out on a lake before I had to perfect my craft. And that's essentially what Heyerdahl was doing. But he was no slouch, right? This dude was Norwegian. And a Norwegian has a couple standard things. I don't want to stereotype anyone, but I'm about to really hard here. There is a seafaring element that I think comes with every Norwegian. Uh, and if they're no good on the sea, well, then they're a Swede. <laughs> but the other thing that we know about all Norwegians is that there's a certain level of um, introvertedness that has to come with all of them. I don't think a day has gone by that I haven't reminded people of the difference between a Norwegian introvert and a Norwegian extrovert. I assume you all know. A Norwegian introvert will stare at their shoes while they talk to you the whole time, which makes sense. Uh, but a Norwegian extrovert will stare at your shoes while they talk to you. That's my best Norwegian joke for the day. Uh, so <laughs> this is the crew of, of the Contiki. Uh, almost entirely Norwegians, except for, of course, Bengst Danielsen, uh, who was a Swede. They brought him along just for ballast, I assume. But this six-man crew was, was all chosen for a variety of skills, but they all had that intrinsic desire for exploration and seafaring built into their code. So, of course, uh, Thor Heyerdahl was our expedition leader. Uh, he gets to write the books, go on tour all the time. And he really just had this theory in his mind that the ancient peoples of South America and Polynesia could have a link to them that could be explained by the fact that they were, in fact, descendants of one another. Um, Eric Hesselberg was the navigator and artist, which I think is a popular distinction there. And then he actually went on to write the children's book, uh, Contiki, and several more things. Ben Danielson uh, was the steward in charge of supplies and daily rations. He's, of course, our Swede, uh, but was also a sociologist and was interested just from his life in the human migration theory uh, and then served as the translator. 
because he was the only member of the crew who spoke Spanish. So we do have to give him that. Uh, Newt Haugland was the radio expert. Uh, and he had been decorated, honestly, by British service in World War II for actions in their Norwegian heavy water sabotage uh, that were believed to stall Germany's plans to develop the atomic bomb. So good job, him. Uh, Torstein Rabi was also in charge of radio transmissions. And then he also gained uh, his radio experience during World War II. Hermann Weitzinger was an engineer whose expertise happened to be in technical measurements. So he was actually the first guy that hired all went to and really helped him develop the idea on how to make that raft. And together they made up the crack team that would lead the Contiki expedition. And then from there, this group of misfits would go on to do other things, but, um, hired all was the one at the source of it all. And from Tigris to raw one and raw two Contiki, all of these vessels, most of which are still in the Oslo museum as well. Uh, you can see that sort of seafaring expedition there. It's worth noting that the Tigris is not to be found anywhere in the world because Heyerdahl burned it in protest of the war. Uh, he was a firm activist throughout his many years as both an adventurer, an expeditionary sociologist, and you know seafaring anthropologist. He was very much a, a humanist at his heart, which I think most Norwegians uh, definitely were, and especially coming out of World War II, right? So in opposition to global conflict, he burned, burned one of his vessels. If you're curious about the life and times of this man, he died in 2002, which really wasn't that long ago, 20 short years, uh, in Italy, where he lived with uh, a lot of his family there. He had a family estate out there, and at 87, he developed a brain tumor. And then as soon as he found out, he decided that he was just ready, that he would greet the great unknown as he had done in every expedition before. So he refused to eat or take medication and went straight to Valhalla from there. And uh, the Norwegian government honored him with a state funeral, even though he was buried in the um, garden of his family estate in Colomicera in Italy there. But this is our guy. And, and Heyerdahl, like I said, I wanted you to get to know a little bit more about him. Obviously, there's so much literature and mythos and documentation about the Heyerdahl expedition and going from South America to Polynesia and beyond. But there's something about that belief in seeking something better and jumping into the unknown that is intrinsically Tacoma. And you get to see a lot of that in the Seaport Museum, you know? Obviously, I spend a lot of time there. I've been doing these virtual tours for them and in-person tours for the Seaport for over two, ne two years now, man. And when I walk around that building, I think I can always see that there is this through line to it all that the early people of Tacoma showed up here not knowing anything about it but believing in their whole heart that it would be a better life in some way and then not just taking it at face value but working hard to actually make that dream a reality for them and so quite a few Norwegians went the Heyerdahl route and jumped into the icy abyss and figured out what was going to be on the other side of the world by going across the Atlantic Ocean and eventually arriving in Tacoma, which is a circuitous route, I admit. So a little bit for you now on the Norwegian uh, immigration to, to Tacoma. But basically what happened is because Tacoma has always been a temperate fishing port, as the city was um, developing as a white city in the 1860s, 1870s, it developed reputation for being great fishing location, very good on the sea, and not too brutal in the winter, which was key. Because a lot of Norwegians left Oslo in the late 1800s because Norway at the time kind of sucked. And then they would arrive to usually the Great Lakes, Michigan, Minnesota, somewhere around there. And they're like, wow, what? This is actually kind of just worse. <laughs> and so then they would then usually move westward from there. And as the train 
expanded across the country and, of course, arrived in the northern terminus of Tacoma. A lot of uh, Norwegians emigrated even farther. And they weren't alone in that. Um, you know, several populations found their way out here. A tremendous amount of uh, Chinese nationals came out with the railroad, and then Japanese nationals were a huge portion of Tacoma's population up until, of course, the you know internment camps of World War II. Uh, but they were here for the exact same reasons. It was familiar, but different enough to be optimistic. Uh, the fishing communities of the Pacific Northwest and the strawberries on the islands were something that the Japanese community could really rally behind. Croatians, and then, of course, the Norwegians. And so when you look at Tacoma's history, there is a huge amount of Norway here. And perhaps the most famous is, of course, our namesake at the Foss Waterway Seaport, the Foss family. And uh, Taya and Andrew here did exactly that. They arrived out in the Midwest, then eventually moved their way out to Tacoma because they found the climate more forgiving than both Oslo or Minnesota. And as they arrived here, they built a name for themselves. And F the Foss family, I feel like I talk about it all the time, but I'm happy to do it again. Uh, Andrew was working as a carpenter when he arrived here in Tacoma. And Taya, not wanting to be idle, took the opportunity when he left for a carpentry gig to buy this disgruntled fisherman's rowboat for five bucks. She cleaned it, painted it, flipped it for a profit, and then eventually turned that into a fleet of rowboats and a profit of $41. And those other rowboats, I think she had 10 by the time Andrew got back after his three-week gig, uh, she was renting out for 50 cents a day to hunters, fishermen, people that needed a ferry across the water to their various jobs. And really, they turned that into this incredible maritime industry. Andrew went back to his original career as a shipwright, and he started building boats and ships and tugboats for Taya, and together they created the Foss Maritime Company. And Taya was the one who came up with the slogan, always ready, and really dedicated herself to not just making a successful business here, but making Tacoma a better community. So here's a Foss tug in action. You can see that they were the number one sort of industry out here. And as a main shipping port, even today, you, you need a tugboat to navigate those larger vessels into something like the Foss Waterway or Port of Tacoma somewhere. And so the Foss tugs were the number ones who were doing that all the time. But they weren't alone either. Uh, this is a picture of a place called Seaman's Rest, uh, which was opened in 1897. And this tiny little wooden structure, which is now a private home, it's still out there in, in Old Town Tacoma, uh, was owned and operated by a woman named Brigitte Funemark, uh, who the sailors in town knew as Mother Funemark, and her daughter, Christine. And uh, Brigitte lost her husband. He was a sailor, a captain, and when he drowned at sea, she kind of needed an opportunity to reinvent her life and come up with something new. So here she is on the left. That's her da daughter. And so she was born near Oslo, just like the, the Fosses. Yeah, but in 1842, and then she just became multilingual, French, German, English, talented musician, and just had a deep belief that people should have a safe haven. So Old Town Tacoma in its heyday, 1860s through the 1890s, was a rough part of the Tacoma history. And, you know, it, I think it had its peak 13 saloons and brothels for like a three block radius. And Seaman's Rest, ironically, was the cleanest boarding house in the area. It was a place where you could find a little bit of respite, maybe a Bible, and actually have a moment's reprieve. You didn't have to worry about getting knifed in the middle of the night. And again, this is on the historic registrar today. It is still right down in Old Town Tacoma. And I like it because it's a testament to that Norwegian population that really came out and was intrinsic in the Tacoma story very early on. And you can see more of it. Uh, a lot of people arrived here early on, like, like the Funemarks and the Fosses, 
drawn by the idea of creating a better life for themselves in somewhere that wasn't Norway. But over time, you know, early 1900s, a lot more Norwegians were drawn out here, not just because they had uh, friends and family in the area who were talking this place up, but it was now the gateway to Mount Rainier. When Mount Rainier became a national park, <clears throat> people came in droves to see this. And Tacoma had the train line that would take people out to the national park. And so you could arrive via ship into Tacoma and then take the, the spur line, the train out to Mount Rainier and people were addicted to it. And it's interesting because in a way I, I equate the various draws of this area to one another, right? So like early on, it was ease of life, fishing, new starts. Then it was Mount Rainier. And then people are like, oh, well, I came for the mountain, but it turns out it's really nice here. I'd like to stay. Uh, then it was industry. You know, Port of Tacoma was really doing a lot of stuff. So people came out. They're like, there are better jobs out here. We'd like to. And then they're like, hot damn, it's really nice out here. We'd like to stay. And even today, uh, nine out of 10 times, if I have someone on a tour who's like, yeah, I live here now. I was in the military. Inevitably, their story is they went to JBLM. They, you know, they got positioned out here. They were like, oh, it's actually really nice out here. And then after they got out of the military, they decided that they would settle down and stay. And that is very much the story with our Norwegian population here as well. So you can see a lot of the traditional historic churches here in Tacoma were uh, Lutheran churches built for that Norwegian population that was coming out here. This is a picture from 1948. Uh, and in particular, this one, Norwegians came from all parts of the state uh, for a Norwegian newspaper, uh, which was published in Fargo, North Dakota. And they, they, they were here for the Leggett Convention, the Rogaland Leggett Convention. Uh, and so all of these like Norwegian experiences and conventions and tourism expos were happening here in Tacoma. And then little by little, everyone was like, oh, shoot. Maybe we should stick around a little bit longer until it got to the point where like now Tacoma is kind of on the map as an unofficial Norwegian destination. This is a picture from, I believe this is 1939, where um, they brought in, in the back here, uh, the chief at the Hotel Winthrop who presented this fish course to Norwegian Crown Prince Olav, uh, who would later be known as King Olav V. And the Crown Prince was here just visiting Norwegian icons and generating support for Norway. And so um, I think it was 400 to 500 local residents attended this banquet at the Crystal Ballroom in the Hotel Winthrop, which is now just across from the Pantages. Uh, the prince and his wife, uh, Princess Martha, uh, were here. They gave speeches. They spoke to little, uh, little dignitaries, politicians at the time. And then 3,000 Tacoma, mostly Norwegians, were in attendance later at the state armory for a public reception, which is here. So this is, uh, again, Crown Prince Olav and Crown Princess Martha at the Tacoma Armory. And this was, again, in 1939. And they they visited the key Norwegian landmarks, right? Uh, which was, at that time, Tacoma. And then, of course, Pacific Lutheran University. So I graduated from PLU. And to this day, they still have these, like, very... Uh, fjord rock wrought iron metal sculptures in Red Square commemorating the time uh, that the crown prince and princess of Norway came to PLU to visit the whole thing, which is such a, a strange footnote there, but really talks to the popularity of this like Norwegian pull to the area, that there was something, some siren's call that brought people from one seafaring community to another out here. Um, also, just a little... Fun trivia for you guys here. Olav was one of the most popular monarchs in all of Norwegian history. Uh, they called him the People's King, and he was just like, like a man of the people. Even when he was king, he would um, 
drive his own cars. He would just go biking. Uh, during the, the fuel crisis of World War II, uh, he decided that he would stop driving, even though he was still allowed to as a royal, but everyone else wasn't allowed to. And so it would just like show up with his skis and walk around downtown. But eventually, uh, he did join the battle in World War II, and then the royal family went into exile. So here they are in exile in Britain. And while they were here in England, he advised war efforts, and then eventually went back and was crowned king of Norway. Uh, so here he is, later on in his life. Now you know a little bit more about Norwegian royalty and Tacoma. All in one side. One second there. If you're looking for more Norwegian influence here, uh, you don't have to go farther than the Hilltop District. This is Normana Hall. And the cornerstone of this building was laid in 1922. Uh, I believe this is Norden Lodge. I always forget if it's two or three. But it is uh, definitely, I think this is two. And, and so there was this huge Norwegian population in Tacoma. They needed a meeting hall, and this is one. And this is still active. Uh, a lot of the descendants and sons and daughters of Norway still find themselves here uh, having regular meetings. I think it's a oh, once a month meeting and a once a month social. I have to double check on that. But you see it, and it just it goes it goes unnoticed. So time the the deep ties to these different communities that came out here. Uh, and the Norwegian seafaring population definitely had a big role to play in this area. Sometimes uh, it ended up backfiring. This is a, a Norwegian ship, the Nordval, uh, which is currently in this picture bound for Japan. This was an interesting story that I used to think about back in the day because in the oh, late 1800s through the 1920s, Tacoma had a very expansive streetcar system, and it ran all the way from downtown Tacoma up to uh, Seattle. We had the inner urban. Most of this was an electrified streetcar, which even today I'm like, wow, ah, I wish I wish it was still here. I'm waiting till 2044 when the light rail finally connects. But this streetcar system was expansive. And then by 1938, they're like, meh, nobody's going to want this. We'll use buses. Buses and cars are the future. So they tore out the majority of those streetcar lines and then just used them as scrap steel. And uh, a lot of the local sailors in the area and this Norwegian vessel got together and they are shipping this across to Japan in 1938 as scrap steel which is a decision uh, Tacoma would later come to regret because, of course, a lot of that scrap steel was repurposed into uh, military devices. But we don't have to dwell on that. Uh, but even here, this is from the 1970s. And you can see this is the uh, the Kristinbake. Uh, this is another Norwegian ship which still frequents Port of Tacoma. Well, it did in the 1970s. We still have quite a few uh, commercial ships out of Norway that come to this area even today. And there's something about that, right, where even now, it's 2020, to still be connected via port to that great diaspora of Norwegians leaving from one location to the other, that even after everything has changed, that connection to the sea and the traditions that are bound to it are still here, I think is pretty remarkable. I got another one here for you. And this is back when... You can see the, the intermodal system of Porto Tacoma was a little bit different than it is today. Oh, here we go. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, 118th anniversary of Sons of Norway here in the area here. Norden 2. I appreciate you uh, coming through on that there. Also, is the sound okay now? I hope that's coming through all right. You never know these days. <clears throat> Bring it back to the slides here. So... This is this is the beginning of, of it all, right? For us tonight, we were talking about the Thor Heyerdahl expedition, which, like I said, turns out to not be correct, but is still very much right. That he had this theory that Polynesia was settled by people coming out of South America, and then he set out to prove that it was possible and proved, in fact, that it was possible. But later we find out that that wasn't actually the story that was told but the risk-taking and the chance to go out and prove 
something and to just put it out there and and experiment to find out one way or the other is the reason that I think the Heyerdahl expedition continues to be something that lingers in everybody's mind. Just that success of daring to, to do something and then see it done in its completion. And that is something that Tacoma thrives at. This is a picture of the, the port of Tacoma in its early days here. No shortage of these people from 1918 um, were Norwegian, still constructing ships out here, no longer in Oslo, but now in Tacoma. And what drew them out here was that same spirit, that same belief that you can't know until you know that you have to take the risk to go out and explore it and to find something new. And you see that not just in Tacoma, but very specifically at the seaport. And that's what I'm talking about. When we, when we go around and, and look beyond just the fact that there's a boat there and you're like, Oh, what's this just one shade deeper. And you see the story and you realize that the, the pulse of Tacoma is still strong in that original through line. So this one here, uh, this is an experimental vessel that was used um, by a crew of young adventurers, um, most notably for me, uh, James Hansen, who rode across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, they did multiple expeditions, uh, 20 days circumnavigating Vancouver Island counterclockwise, uh, which I think I've got a little chart of here. Wow. Uh, this is some of the most treacherous icy and terrifying waters out there. And they rode, they were in this, what, like four inches above the water, rowing, sleeping in these little compartments all the way around here. And then again, across the Atlantic. And why? For the adventure, to prove theories that have been questioned, to know something concretely, and to just take the risk to find something out firsthand. And all of the vessels at the seaport speak to that spirit. They are small and intimate, and they are almost always handcrafted. And each one of them isn't just there because it's a pretty boat. It's there because of the story attached to it, that something about the person who navigated it or crafted it is important to that grit city atmosphere and belief that we can do something more than is expected. And you see that in the FOSS enterprise, you see it in the way that they created their boats and they created their business, not just to make a profit, but to make Tacoma and its community stronger. And you see that in the seaport that they're down there right now telling the stories of this area and doing so with the intention of not just making, you know, history accessible, but hopefully making everybody's life a little bit better. And so that's what I'm going to leave you with right here. A FOSS invention. This was the FOSS cow, uh, which in the early days was used as a fog horn. <laughs> uh, they would bring the cow down to the shore in a heavy fog and let her moo and then people could navigate safely back by the bellows of this cow. And that sort of enterprising spirit, just a little bit off, but perfectly functional, is exactly what I hope that we all take out into the future from here. So let that be a rallying cry. Um, take a note from Thor. Do something bold in your life in the future, I hope. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Take a chance on something and hope that even if you're proven incorrect later, that you still did the right thing. And let that be Tacoma's rallying cry tonight. If you guys have questions, comments, let me know. I'm available and I'm always interested in the story of this area, even when I'm sometimes wrong. But thank you guys for joining us tonight. And take advantage of the third Thursday of every month because it's free admission to the seaport. So you really have nothing to lose by going down and experimenting and seeing a little bit of what they have to offer down there. Until next time, my friends, I will see you guys soon. Very sincerely. I hope you keep on exploring.